This tutorial is about a mode of ventilation that I think is a little bit underused in critical care. It is about volume guaranteed pressure support, otherwise known as volume support. Tutorial 27. This is a section on modern modes of mechanical ventilation. And this tutorial is on volume support, which is also known as volume guaranteed pressure support or volume assured pressure support. In the previous tutorial, I discussed volume guaranteed pressure control and the strengths and limitations of volume control ventilation versus pressure control and why volume guaranteed pressure control is a neat solution to many of the problems associated with those modes. I explained how to set up volume guaranteed pressure control, the limitations of using this particular mode of ventilation. But in summary, I suggested that it's one of those modes that you could use as your default mode in the ICU because it just works really well. This time I'm going to discuss something quite similar, and this is volume guaranteed pressure support. And this mode has not caught on as well as volume guaranteed pressure control. I'm going to talk about how it's set up and how to use it and the advantages and disadvantages of volume support. Let's go back to the ICU. You'll recall we had a patient called Loretta who was admitted earlier today, intubated, and we put her on volume guaranteed pressure control, the assist control mode. And now she's assisting every breath and you want to change her over to assisted spontaneous breathing. What are the options? Well, there are three real options for the majority of patients, although there are many, many different modes that you can use for assisted spontaneous breathing. But essentially what you have is pressure support that we've talked in detail about in earlier tutorials, automatic tube compensation, and the third one is volume support. Pressure support is a marvelous mode of ventilation, but it has several limitations. Although the patient's spontaneous breaths are all supported, the pressure limit is constant from breath to breath, although tidal volumes can be quite variable. If a patient deteriorates, the tidal volumes will drop with the deterioration of lung compliance. Conversely, if the patient's lungs improve, the tidal volumes may be absolutely enormous. The idea of volume support is volume assured pressure support. It looks like pressure support, but the inspiratory pressure levels vary from breath to breath and the ventilator alters support levels in order to deliver the desired tidal volumes. However, compared with automatic tube compensation, there is no change in the pressure flow relationships within the breath. Things change from breath to breath, but not within the breath. Let's look at some of the key components of volume support. First of all, it's patient triggered, so you're going to use flow by triggering or pressure triggering. The initial flow is controlled by the rise time or slope, just like pressure support. It's flow cycled using expiratory sensitivity, but you set a tidal volume, not a pressure support inspiratory pressure level. You set a tidal volume and the pressure support is variable. It's determined by the ventilator. So it's a kind of a closed loop system. The ventilator decides how much pressure support the patient gets. So when you're setting up the ventilator, you set a tidal volume, an FiO2, PEEP, a rise time, trigger flow or pressure, an end inspiratory cycle percentage, and a Pmax. This is the screen setup for the volume support in the Puritan Bennett 980. First you go to spontaneous and then to volume support. This is where you set the tidal volume, not the pressure support level. Here's the rise time, the expiratory sensitivity, and most importantly, you must set the peak inspiratory pressure. Just like in volume guaranteed pressure control, the peak inspiratory pressure has a ledge below that called the pressure limit at which the ventilator will not exceed during pressure limited breaths. So on the Puritan Bennett ventilator, we know from previously that that's minus three centimeters of water. So the pressure limit on this particular patient is gonna be 27 centimeters of water. That's pretty generous. This is where you'll find the mode on the Draeger Avita ventilator. Again, note the tidal volume and the various settings, the FiO2, the slope, the PEEP. And there's a pretty impressive Pmax here that's been set up for this particular patient, 35. That will set the pressure limit at 30. And that is an awful lot for a patient 
on a pressure supported mode and you need to be careful because often the ventilator will default to, to this kind of highest setting because that might be what you might have set up normally for pressure control for patients who are completely different. This is the setup on a servo ventilator. This is PRVC originally. You can see the little baby at the top, but we're changing over to volume support ventilation. And you can see here the tidal volume has been set. Now it's important to understand that on this particular pop-up window, there is no place to set the P max. You've got to go and look for this somewhere else in the vent settings and you must set it. So it is imperative in volume support, just like in volume guaranteed pressure control, that you carefully set the P max. And I showed you this slide before in a previous tutorial. This is the pressure limit for various ventilators. So for the Macui Servo I and U, it's minus five. It's the same for the Draeger Evita, minus five. On the Daytex Ometer machines for volume control, guaranteed pressure control, it's minus five, but this mode is not on that ventilator. It may be introduced at some stage in the future. The Puritan Bennett is minus three, and the Hamilton T1 is minus 10. So if you set 30 as your P max, the pressure limit is gonna be 20 on pressure support. So be careful using the Hamilton that you actually give the patient enough space to get sufficient pressure support to make sure that they get the tidal volume that you're looking for. You would normally set a minimal and a maximum inspiratory pressure on volume guaranteed pressure support, but the default in most ventilators is fine, and it's usually about 1.5 centimeters of water. That's just the base flow going through the system, and you're not gonna change that because you don't want someone getting seven or 800 mils when they have normally compliant lungs. You want them to get the minimum support that they need. And again, depending on the ventilator, the, the maximum pressure support, inspiratory pressure, pressure support level is the Pmax minus three on the Puritan Bennett or five on the servo. So how it works in the servo is the first breath is 10 centimeters of water of pressure support. The ventilator then uses that breath to calculate the pressure needed to generate the required tidal volume. And then it starts a kind of a startup sequence and it gradually increases the pressure levels up to 20 centimeters of water. And when it's done that, it gives the patient the pressure support level that it thinks it needs. Subsequently, the ventilator may make changes from breath to breath, but it doesn't make sweeping changes. It doesn't give 20 centimeters of water of pressure support in one breath and five in the next. It limits those changes from breath to breath to a maximum of plus or minus three centimeters of water. If the ventilator cannot achieve the required tidal volume using the pressure limit, an alarm goes on and you need to decide whether to increase the Pmax or change the mode of ventilation. I'll explain that a little bit more later on in this tutorial. Cycling to exhalation can occur three ways in volume support on all these ventilators. When the inspiratory flow decreases below the expiratory sensitivity level, for example, if it's 25% of peak flow and the peak flow is 60 liters, it will cycle off at 15 liters. If the upper pressure limit is exceeded, that's the P max, usually that's caused by the patient coughing or bucking on the ventilator. And if the maximum time for inspiration is exceeded, you will normally set this, but it's defaulted at 1.5 to two seconds. And certainly you do not want to be seeing two second inspiratory times plus on um, pressure support. Now, if you just quickly eyeball this picture, you think, oh yeah, this is pressure support but it's not, this is volume support. And I can demonstrate to you why this is volume support. If I draw a line on the pressure waveform, you can see here that each one of the three breaths that are represented, which look like they've normal flow patterns, have different pressure levels. And when you open up the picture and look below, you can see that this patient is breathing spontaneously on volume support with a set volume of 380 mils, a flow by of three liters, and expiratory sensitivity 25%. Now let's look at a patient who has just come back from the operating room following cardiac surgery. The patient has started to breathe spontaneously so we have put them on volume support. And here are the settings. You can see here we've set all the usual things that you would see with pressure support ventilation except we've put on a tidal volume rather than a pressure support level. 
Just note that the dynamic compliance here is okay, but it's not stellar. And this is typical of post-operative patients. They have lots of compression atelectasis, absorption atelectasis, and particularly after cardiac surgery, they may have some extravascular lung water. So the lungs are a bit soggy and stiff. And so this is an ideal situation for using volume support because the patient's lungs will improve over time. So let's see what their waveforms look like. And you can see here, this is the patient waveform. And if you didn't know this was volume support, you would think this is pressure support. And what's very interesting here is that we've set a tidal volume of 470 mils, and pretty much that's what the ventilator delivered for this patient. Not infrequently, it will be a little bit higher than that if the lungs are very compliant, but it is really reassuring in this patient population that the goal tidal volume is being achieved. Now the other time that volume support may be useful is in, in patients who are slow to wean from mechanical ventilation or who have deteriorated. And in this case, this is a patient who has a size 5.5 tracheostomy tube who had an aspiration event and there was some difficulty getting the pressure support level right for him. So we put him on volume support. And you can see here the tidal volumes are very variable. And the current tidal volume is 335 mils. And you might think that, oh, no, it's not doing its job. But actually, if you average his tidal volumes over a minute, he did seem to get 420 mils. And it was really reassuring for me as a bedside clinician that this patient was being adequately ventilated despite having a very, very small airway to ventilate him through. Let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using volume support. It seems to me that volume support is an ideal transition tool between controlled mechanical ventilation and semi-supported spontaneous breathing modes such as automatic tube compensation, T-pieces or minimal pressure support. This is the patient who may be post-op or have soggy or sticky lungs or lots of pulmonary edema or just intense atelectasis. And they're beginning to breathe up, but their compliance isn't great, but it will improve. It's really forgiving because the average tidal volume is delivered over time, irrespective of lung disease and dynamic changes in compliance resistance and patient position. It also avoids the risk of the stupid person who might wander up to the ventilator, think that the patient is, for example, taking too big a tidal volume or too little a tidal volume and starts fiddling with the pressure support. Pressure support is a mode that you really do need to look at over time because there is tremendous biological variability in ventilation and the tidal volumes can vary. but. We don't always want that. Sometimes we just want an adequate minute ventilation for the patient and we want generous tidal volumes that overcome the dead space fraction. It's also really reassuring if you have a distracted or inexperienced bedside practitioner. And what I mean by distracted is there is a lot of activity going on in the ICU all the time. And not infrequently, the bedside practitioner gets called away to help out with setting up dialysis or admitting a patient or drawing up drugs, or there may be a cardiac arrest or emergency or big resuscitation going on. And it's really, really reassuring for them if they can put the patient on volume support that they don't have to be eyeballing the ventilator every minute or two. Let's look at the drawbacks of using volume support. The major drawback of volume support relates to its major benefit in that because it's a closed loop mode of ventilation, you may not notice a deterioration in the patient's respiratory function as the ventilator is making adjustments on your behalf. And this is particularly problematic if you set the Pmax too high, for example, at 35 centimeters of water. Within that paradigm, if you're using 5 of PEEP, it is possible to give 25 centimeters of water of pressure support to maintain that tidal volume. And that's a lot. In general, we don't like to see a pressure support level of more than 20. And it's much easier to police the pressure support in spiritual pressure level if you're setting it, because often on the ventilator, it's really hard to identify how much pressure support the patient is getting in volume support. And often you still need a minimum settings mode, such as automatic tube compensation, 
use of a T-piece or pressure support, as I've previously mentioned some of the time. Because, again, making a decision to extubate a patient or put them on high flow, you really like to see really minimal settings. It's kind of hard to achieve on volume support. I want to just mention for a couple of minutes what happens in pressure support versus volume support where lung compliance is falling. So in this picture here, we have a flow waveform on the top, the pressure waveform on the bottom with a PEEP set of five. And the patient is on pressure support of 10 centimeters of water, an FO2 of 40%, a PEEP of five, and a slope of 0 0.2. And the patient takes a breath. You can see the little divot before the pressure support breath is initiated and the patient's breath is flow cycled. The peak flow is about 60 liters, so the flow cycles off at about 15 liters per minute. Then the patient's lung compliance starts to fall, and this is what you commonly see. The divot just before the breath is lower. The pressure is exactly the same, so the patient will still get 10 centimeters of water, but the driving pressure will be just that little bit less, and the compliance will have fallen, so the tidal volume falls. Now, this doesn't always happen, but this is what usually happens. The alternative thing that sometimes happens is this, where the patient starts to gasp a bit. So they start to suck in a lot of gas into their lungs. That increases the driving pressure, and so the inspiratory flow goes up, and it might go up to 70 or 80 litres, cycling off at 20 litres. And while that might maintain the tidal volume, the patient does look significantly more distressed. In comparison, when you look at volume support with worsening compliance, it's a little bit different. And here we set the tidal volume at 450 mils with otherwise the same settings. The major setting that we have to put in here is the Pmax that I have set here at 25 centimeters of water. And we're using a ventilator that gives a pressure limit of the Pmax minus five. So the pressure limit is now 20 centimeters of water. When the patient takes their first breath, that breath is volume supported up to a pressure limit of about 15. That's the equivalent of a pressure support of 10. And the patient gets the tidal volume that you wish them to get. But then their lungs start to deteriorate and the compliance falls. So what happens is the ventilator adjusts the pressure level to deliver that tidal volume of 450 mils within that 20 centimeters of water pressure limit window. So even though the lungs are less compliant, the tidal volume is exactly the same here. However, if the patient deteriorates further or the patient starts to gasp, sometimes it will happen that the pressure limit will be inadequate for the pressure that is required to give the patient the tidal volume. So the tidal volume falls. And that does happen in volume support. It doesn't always guarantee the tidal volume for the simple reason that you have to set a pressure limit. And of course, if the patient is pressure limiting like this with the reasonable looking pressures, you really do need to start thinking about putting the patient back in a controlled mode where you have longer inspiratory times, such as pressure assist control. So what about those minimum settings that I mentioned earlier on? I really don't think that volume support has any advantages over low levels of pressure support or automatic tube compensation for patients with normally compliant lungs. Like volume guaranteed pressure control, it is a really reassuring mode in situations where lung pressure volume relationships are changing dynamically. And that is particularly the case when a patient has gone from a control mode to a spontaneously breathing supported mode. I really think that's where the role of volume support is in that transitionary period, as I've already mentioned. And again, it's also really helpful where the bedside professional is inexperienced or distracted. Let's review this tutorial. In this tutorial, I discussed volume guaranteed pressure support, otherwise known as volume support. I discuss what volume support is and how it is different from pressure support. The logic of using volume support in that transition period between control ventilation and minimal settings. The setup for using volume guaranteed pressure support on a couple of different ventilators and then the limitations and the advantages of using it. 
In the next tutorial, I'm going to move on to another modern mode of ventilation. And this is a mode that I call bi-level pressure control. This mode is known by an abundance of different monikers, but this is the title I'm going to give it. And it is a mode that is characterized by active exhalation. I'll explain what that is and why it's important. I'll show you how to set up and use bi-level and we'll discuss using bi-level as a standard mode of ventilation in patients in the ICU who roll in for all kinds of reasons as an alternative, for example, to volume guaranteed pressure control, volume assist control, pressure control or SIMV. I'll see you then and I guarantee you'll learn something. So that was a tutorial on volume support. I hope you found it useful. If you're enjoying these tutorials, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or follow me at ccmtutorials.org.